This is a prayer card, and these slips are on the entryway, and these are available at any time for you to fill out and just stick it in the agape box. And uh, these prayer requests will be prayed for every week. Okay, and we're glad you're here. So let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to uh, bless our time. Father, as we come to worship you here, we pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to come and fill this place, to come upon us with your power and your peace, fill our hearts and give us your, your mind as we receive from you today. And as we worship you now, Lord, let it come from the overflow of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. If I could have everybody stand together. <clears throat> And I'm going to be reading from uh, Psalm 98. If you have your Bibles, you can read along with me. Psalm 98. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Bring, break forth in song, rejoice, and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a song. With trumpets and the sound of a horn, shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. Amen. You may have a seat. So the Lord has made known his salvation. Jesus, his name means the Lord, Yahweh, is salvation. Last week we rejoiced in the empty tomb and the reality of that day that when Christ rose from the dead, he defeated death. And we continue to do that, right? We did that on Resurrection Sunday, but every day should be a day that we rejoice in our salvation. So we in, the, in our brokenness and our frailty, we can approach a holy God, the only God, because we know that Jesus our Savior took the penalty of our sins, that cross, and we can know life in him, life in him. So can we rejoice in that? Are we in awe of the reality, the miracle of mercy, the miracle of our salvation? So this morning, let's ask the Lord to help us to just meditate, recognize the holiness of God, and to remember how while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We want to rejoice in the Lord's salvation. So Lord, we look to you. We want to call on your name. Everything you have created praises you, Lord. We want to be those who praise you willingly in this place. Thank you for this time that we have together to rejoice together in you and your salvation, that you are king, you are our great God, the great God of heaven. Let's worship together.
For the Lord is the great God and the great King of all.
having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness is from God. Let this, these next couple songs, I just want them to be a prayer. So we can meditate on the greatness of
Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, Lord. Let our worship be more than just a song.
And Lord, we thank you that you are king of, this, of, the, of the universe, Lord, of this world, of the nations. You're the God of all gods, Lord. And we see the world that we live in. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it, Lord. Sometimes it seems like the kingdoms of this world are, are just going to overrun everything. But we know, Lord, as we read in that psalm, Psalm 98, that you, you are king. Lord, and we want you to be king of our lives. We don't want to just say those things. We don't want to just ask, Lord, in, in, without being sincere about it, Lord. We want to say with, with all sincerity, Lord, in, in spirit and in truth, that we want you to be Lord of our lives. So we yeah. thank you for your word. Yeah. And would you use your word this morning by the power of your spirit to change our hearts, yeah. to change our lives, and we wouldn't just hear what you say, but we would be doers of what you say, we, that we could go out and declare with our lives how great is our God. We yeah. declare it with our lips, but we want to declare with our lives how great is our God. So we thank you for this time together, and we agree together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before you're seated, we want another minute. Hello. <laughs> Disaster 
you know, the roses of success, those old guys sitting there, and they're trying to do it in their own power. But God makes everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. That there's eternity has been placed in each and every person's heart. There's e eternity is here. Uh, that we're looking around. Uh, we, we desire eternity. We desire to know the Lord. And so there's questions that we ask. You see it in the Bible, there was, you guys remember the rich young ruler? The question that he asked, he had eternity in his heart, and yet he knew he was falling short, he was missing something, and so he goes to Jesus, and he asks Jesus, he says, Jesus, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? He knew that there was something more, he knew he was missing it. He says, what good thing must I do? Oh, man. We see questions today. There's people that ask, what happens when I, when I die? What happens when this body finally gives out? What, what goes on is, is this all that there is to life? Is what we see all that there is to life? Uh, man, uh, it, why is there evil in the world? We see these questions being asked. The thought behind all of these questions is mankind instinctively knows that this is not it. There's something more. There's something more than, than what our senses can see and hear and feel and touch. There's something more than what we can observe. And we understand that the way that this world is going is not the way that it was created to be. And so we see that there's, there's something going on. Something is wrong. Something is missing. And then we get into the biggest problem that we have. We know that there's a problem. We see that there's something wrong with the world in which we live. And... <laughs> Our biggest problem rears its ugly head. Our biggest problem is what? Pride. Our biggest problem is pride. This is our main issue. We look at all the challenges that face the world today, even face ourselves, and what do we say? We say, I can fix it. I can. I can fix it. I can go out there and I can, I can make it better. And we want to be our own savior. I can save myself. I can do it. And has this ever worked in the history of mankind? It began with, with there in the garden with Adam and Eve, they could not save themselves. They tried, they made fig leaves. Nothing. The Lord says, that's not going to cover you guys. That doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem of sin. There's a sacrifice there in the garden. And then it goes on with Cain. Cain says, what? I can make my own way to God. I don't have to come in the prescribed manner. I can go myself and I can figure out my own way to, the, to go to the Lord. And the Lord says, no, no, no. Babylon comes along and says, look at this. We're the height of civilization. We're, we're, we're the best that there ever is. We can save ourselves. They're lost in the pages of history. In the past, present, even future. None of these things are going to save us. We cannot fix ourselves. We've never been able to save ourselves. We will never save ourselves. And even in the future, we're never going to be able to save ourselves. But that doesn't stop us from trying or wanting to. The Bible is very clear that there is going to be a time in the future, and I believe that this time is coming very soon, where there will be a gentleman that comes upon this planet and says, I can fix it. I can bring peace. We'll sign a treaty there in the Middle East, and there will be peace in the Middle East. Seven of a treaty. Let's sign the treaty. Let's build a temple for the, for the Jews to worship. If you follow me, there'll be peace. And the world will say, that sounds great, because we've been trying, and it doesn't work. And they'll follow and three and a half years later, they'll say, I'm God, worship me. Take this mark to prove your worship. And the world will go after this guy. And how does it end? We know him as the Antichrist. How does that end? We know how it ends. It ends in absolute disaster and failure. Mankind can never save themselves. We need Jesus. We have eternity in our hearts. We believe that we can fix it. We believe we can do it ourselves, and yet we cannot. And so I'll give you a fun illustration of what this looks like. Have you seen those? My daughter showed me these things on the phone. Uh, expectation versus reality. Have you ever seen those? There's an expectation and then there's reality. Well, there's an expectation of the world and then there's the reality of the world. There's, there's what mankind thinks that they're doing versus what mankind is actually doing. And so I have a nice little fun one for you. Here it is. Expectation. The world believes that fix it Felix Jr. That they can wave their little magic golden hammer and everything will be perfect. It's a can-do attitude. I can fix it. I can do it. I'm going to double our efforts. If we only follow our hearts, everything is going to be grand and great. Just follow, the, follow your heart. And yet reality is much different because the Bible says very clearly, apart from God, our efforts amount to 
what? Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Not a thing. Yes, you might busy yourself with work. Yes, you might accomplish some things. But in the grand scheme of eternity, the things that are accomplished are absolutely nothing. You can accomplish nothing is what Jesus says. And so our hearts that Natcon believes are these beautiful things. And if we just follow them, everything is going to be great. The Bible tells you about your heart. And the Bible's estimation of our hearts is much different than mankind's estimation of our hearts. What does the Bible say about our hearts? The Bible says our hearts are evil and desperately wicked. Oh my goodness. They're, they're desperately wicked. And if you rely on your own efforts, if you follow your hearts, you're not fixing Felix Jr. Oh, we're wrecking Ralph. Everything that we touch, we wreck. We destroy everything that we touch, and so the Bible is absolutely clear. We cannot do it. We're made for a restored relationship. We're created for eternity, and yet we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Our sin separates us. Our sin separates us from a holy God. And we cannot do anything. We cannot save ourselves. There's nothing we can do. We're lost. Oh, my goodness. It's hopeless. Oh, well, my two favorite words in the Bible. But... God. As soon as you read those words in the Bible, but God, now you're getting somewhere because you can't do it in and of yourself. And yet the two words, but God, what we can do, God did. That's the, that's the thing. He made a way when there was no way. He came and took on humanity. He took on flesh. Emmanuel is my favorite name of God. Emmanuel, God in the flesh, God with us, God to the rescue. That he came, he lived the life that I could not live, the perfect life. And he took my punishment there on the cross, and we celebrated last week his resurrection. Man, he demonstrated love towards us, and even on, on Friday night, they had my favorite verse in the video that we watched, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were yet sinners, while we were his enemies, while we hated him and wanted nothing to do with him, Christ died for us. There on the cross, when you wanted nothing to do with the Lord, he died for you. That is the, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. And we celebrated last week. He didn't say that. He rose again three days later, proving that he is God, proving that the sacrifice was accepted, that there is a way for our relationship to be restored. John 1, 12, yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives them the right to become children of God. I was child. When I, as Abraham, come to the Lord in faith and say, Lord, I just, I believe. I believe that you lived. I believe that you lived a perfect life, that you took my place there on the cross. I believe that my price has been paid. I believe that you are God. I'm a child. I'm his child. Do business with God. That's what we say here. Do business with God because this isn't between you and someone else. I can't. You know, my faith is not your faith. Your faith is your faith alone. You have to do business with God. This is the most important decision that we can ever make. Is our relationship with God restored? We are created for relationship. Is our relationship with God restored? Is your relationship with God restored? Are you justified? Am I justified in the sight of God? Have I responded as Abraham did by faith? And the answer must be yes, because as we respond, we're justified. As Paul would be telling us in the book of Romans, as you respond to the Lord, you're justified. And as he's justified you, he's sanctifying you. And as he's sanctifying you, filling you with his spirit, one day he's going to glorify you and he's already there. And therefore, out of the love that God has poured out on you, out of the love that he's given you, there's an enablement now to love others. What God has freely extended to Eli, Eli is to freely extend to the others in his life starting with Lorena, starting with my kids, starting with my church family, and spreading out into the community, into the world at large, wherever my feet will go, and to extend freely what God has freely extended to me. We are to extend freely what God has extended to us. And this is, this is what we've learned as we've gone through the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. And now we come to chapter 12. The most important thing is our relationship with God. The most important thing is a restored relationship with the Lord, because out of that relationship with God, everything else flows. There, we can do nothing apart from that relationship. And so Paul brings this out in the first two verses of Romans, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. Father God, we commit this time to you. 
Lord, forgive us. For so many times, there's times in my own life, and I know there's times in each one of our lives we feel that we can do it on our own, that we're fixing Felix Jr., that we can just wave a magic hammer of trying harder or following our hearts or any number of things. And Lord, all we do is like, even like Abraham did that with Ishmael, and we just make messes. But Lord, thank you for your faithfulness, your faithful love towards us. Lord, help us this morning to hear from your word. Our ears are attentive to your word and to your voice. Would we hear from you? And Lord, would you challenge us? Lord, you don't want to leave us the same that, that we came in here. You want to change us. So challenge us through your word this morning, God. Encourage us to be children of God, sons and daughters of the Most High. And so we commit this time to you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, Paul has written 11 chapters. And he's talked about our condition. He's talked about sin. He's talked about justification by faith. He's talked about sanctification. He's talked about glorification. He's even shown that when we're faithless, God remains faithful. He's going to continue his plan and purpose. It's going to come to pass. And because of all of this, therefore, because of everything Paul has written, this, he makes an appeal to us as brothers and sisters in Christ. Why does he make an appeal? Well, you guys know we've been hiking up a mountain in the book of Romans. We ended there. We're there in the peaks of these mountains in the book of Romans. And Paul knows here in chapter 12, we're now descending back down. We're going down from the peaks. We're going down. And as we go down, we can see the world waiting for us in the valley. We can see the cities of the valley. We can see the kingdom of the world down there in the valley. And it's there. And as we get down into the valley, down into the kingdom of the world, oh my goodness, there's going to be challenge. But we're commissioned by God. God has commissioned and sent us. He says, go down. Go back into the kingdom of this world. Go back in. And, and, and I'm commissioning you as what? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. I'm commissioning you as an ambassador of Christ. That God pleads through you, through your words, through your life. To be reconciled to a holy God. What has happened to you, God wants to do with others. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so we're an ambassador representing God in the midst of a dark and hurting generation. And I love what John Stott says about this. In spite of our newness in Christ, where we are dead to sin and alive to God, Romans 6, 11, holiness, holy living is neither automatic nor inevitable. As we adventure through life, holiness just doesn't automatically happen. You don't just wake up one morning and be like, oh, I'm holy today. <laughs> Let's go. I can do it. No. There's time. There's decisions that need to be made. And so Paul makes an appeal to us. He says, there is a decision that has to be made. As you go down into the valley, down into the kingdom of the world, there's a decision. You have to make a choice. And this is a personal choice between you and the Lord. And there becomes an interesting thing. There becomes a mistake, a grave mistake. There are those who believe this is only, only a one-time choice. And that's it. But what do I mean by that when I say there are those who believe it's only a one-time choice? We see this all around us. People come and they, they make a decision and say, I'm going to follow the Lord. And they say a prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer. And then they go and they live how they please. And yet they feel justified. They say, I'm okay with the Lord. I said a prayer one time. Now I can just go and do whatever I want. I can live how I please. I made a choice one time in the past, and now uh, the God's free. He, he just he allows me to do whatever I want. And we know, we, and we know that this is not true. They believe that they're, they're okay with the Lord because they made a one-time decision. We know this thinking is faulty because of the very words of Jesus Christ. The scariest passage in the Bible, you guys know what it is. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23 is the scariest passage in the entire Bible. Not everyone who says to me on that day when you stand before the Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many, many, this is many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you to part from you, workers of lawlessness. Jesus tells us very clearly, there will be those who on that day will say, Lord, Lord, because they said it in this lifetime. 
They, they say, Lord, Master, you are Master. They say these things with their mouths, and then they go out and they live their will, not God's will. They're doing what they want rather than what God would have them do. They made a one-time choice, but it wasn't a continual daily choice. They said, I have one-time choice is enough. I don't need to make a choice today. I'm just going to live how I please. Be careful. Jesus tells them, when you're living your will, you've got to be careful because your relationship with the Lord may not be restored because you're not walking in obedience to the Lord. And then, then it gets even scarier because it, Jesus says there are those who are going to do many works, great works, in the name of Jesus. And yet they did it for themselves. They weren't walking in obedience to God. And so, hey, it's, uh, I don't know you guys. We don't have a restored relationship. Yes, the decision to follow God is a one-time decision. There is a one-time decision that you have made where you said, I am going to follow the Lord. And for every one of us, that happened at a different point in our lives where we said, I am going to follow Jesus. Figure that no matter what happens, I'm going to follow the Lord. And as we made that decision, we also made a decision the next day. Because we woke up the next day, there were challenges that day. There were some circumstances that day. There were some others in our lives that day. And we had to make a decision that day and said, today, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Regardless of what happens today, Lord, I'm going to follow you. And then we went to sleep and we woke up the next day. And it's every day. There's a daily, moment-by-moment -moment decision that we say, I am going to follow the Lord. Lord, fill me with your spirit. I am dependent upon you. I want to operate in obedience to your will. And therefore, the most important thing is, is your relationship with the Lord restored? Because if my relationship with the Lord is restored, if I'm filled with the Spirit, all that I have learned and know of the Lord, it translates how to how I live. And so uh, an internal change is seen and observed externally. An internal change is seen and observed externally. An internal change is there's now daily decisions that have to be made because there's been an internal change. And that was my favorite one is Lorena. How do I know that Lorena had an internal surgery? How do I know? Because she told me, hey, I had an internal surgery. That's great. Someone tells you, man, there's something that happened inside me. Awesome. Praise the Lord. But I also know because I was there. Even better. And I heard the doctor that said there was an internal change. Look at all the scars that, that went on. But now with that internal change that happens to Lorena, there's now a daily decision that has to be made. Because the doctor says, your body's now going to tell you what foods you can and cannot eat. And so now every, every moment of every day, Lorena has to make a decision. Am I going to eat this thing that is now before me, or am I going to refrain? Because if she makes a decision to eat something, she's not allowed, I can't say allowed, not supposed to eat. There are immediate consequences to that decision. And so there's, there was a one-time decision, I'm going to have the surgery. I need this surgery. There's a one-time decision. I'm, I, I, I'm going through the room. I need this surgery. And so there's a surgery that's performed. But now because the internal change has happened, there's a day-by-day -day decision that goes on in Lorena's life. There's a day-by-day -day decision. And so there's daily choices, daily decisions. Paul is encouraging us. Yes, you've made a once-and-for-all decision, but it's going to be followed up by daily decisions. He appeals to us. You've made a one-time decision like Abraham did. You responded to God in faith. God has changed you from the inside out. He's shown you great mercy. How has God shown you great mercy? It's here. He's shown you mercy. The cross is a picture of the mercy of God. By placing on Jesus Christ what was meant for me, what was meant for you, the cross is a picture of his great mercy towards us. And therefore, because of everything God has done, everything God is doing today, and everything God will do, we've responded. We've made a one-time decision and said, yes, I'm going to follow you, Lord. You are Lord of my life. And that one-time decision now leads me and you and us to a daily decision. I'm going to follow the Lord today. Moment by moment, I'm going to follow the Lord. And what is that daily decision that we're called to make? Paul tells us. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What is the response? What is the decision that I need to make today? The decision that I need to make, the decision you need to make. Are you going to worship God as God today? The Lordship of Christ is God, Lord of your life today. What does that mean? 
You guys know what it means. When you say somebody is Lord, somebody is master, when master says go do something, what do you do? I don't really want to do that. I'm kind of tired right now. Would you mind serving me, God? Can, can you bring me some, some food? Can, can, I, can, I, can I have breakfast? How about lunch, dinner? Can I just stay in bed today? You would never say that to a master. You would never do that. To, well, just imagine if your earthly boss told you to do something. Imagine if you were in the military. And in the military, some of these guys, they ask our servicemen and women to do some crazy things. And yet the servicemen and women, I was just talking to this, to Spencer last week, the servicemen and women, what do the servicemen and women do? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because you're my authority. You're the master. I'm going to do what you say. This is what it is. And yet they, how many times do we tell our master now? And that's what, that's what Paul is saying here. We're presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. This is our worship. Our worship of God is more than just singing of a song on Sunday morning, although it includes that. This, this time, that, that half an hour that we have together of corporate worship, that's not all worship is. Our worship, uh, worship of God does not just in, mean coming to church or going to a Bible study, although it includes that. Worship of God is everything. It's our entire lives, our entire beings. I mean, Paul says your spiritual worship very clearly. What does he say? It's to present your body as a living sacrifice. There's a once in all moment where you say, Lord, I present myself to you in faith. And then there's a daily decision every day. I have a decision. Am I going to offer myself to the Lord today or am I going to roll off the altar as Pastor Rick would always remind us? He would tell us what do living sacrifices do? Living sacrifices roll off the altar. Because we want to do it our way. We don't want the Lordship of Christ at times. We fall into sin at times. And this is a once and for all moment followed by a daily choice. And what is another good example of this? A good example. We did did our first class on Friday night, marriage. In marriage, there is a once and for all moment where you make a decision, a covenant between the Lord and you and your spouse. That I'm going to be married, I'm going to be joined to this person for my life. And, And you make a covenant we talked about it on Friday night, and when you make your covenant, you say your vows, and what do you say? You say, man, in plenty and in want. No matter if we have a bunch of stuff or not much stuff, in joy and sorrow and sickness and health, till we have to do this part. Imagine, that's a once and, what's a once and for all decision that you made there before that pastor and before the Lord and before your friends and family, before your spouse. That's a once and for all decision. But just imagine you made that covenant. And then you went out and you just lived in peace. If you went out the next day and say, spouse, you're here to serve me. I'm the boss. Just do everything I want you to do. And I'm just going to live how I please. And if you don't meet my needs, I'm gonna, we're going to get a divorce. You just imagine if you did that. What would happen? And this is what happens in the majority of marriages in the United States today. You exist to serve me. It's just a piece of paper. There's just a contract. It's not a covenant. They talked about it on Friday night. It's a contract, not a covenant. It's how, how, the, how the world looks at marriage. And when that happens, that how does it end? It ends in shipwreck. Because God's plan and purpose for marriage, for husbands and wives, is to experience what? Unity, oneness, and joy. To show the world his great love for us. This is what marriage is to be. It's designed to show your neighbors and your friends, your kids, God's love. For us, and and we have to, we made a one-time choice, but there must be a daily choice. I'm going to lay down my will. I'm going to lay down my will. I'm going to lay down that pride. Because what does pride cry out in your heart? We sing the song. It's all about you, Jesus. And yet, what does pride cry out when you sing that song? It's all about me, Jesus. And all this is for me. We become King Nebuchadnezzar in that moment. What happens to King Nebuchadnezzar? He says, you're struck down. Time, time, and half a time until you know. Until you know the Lordship of God. And this is the vital thing. Do we, the, the marriage is to show the Lordship of God and His great love for us. How we love our spouses. is showing the world God's love for us. Um, we extend, I extend to Lorena. What God has freely extended to me. I extend it to her. She extends to me what God has freely extended to her. The living sacrifice is a one-time decision followed by day-to-day choice. 
I'm going to choose today to lay down my pride. Lord, you are king of my life. Uh, this is what Jesus would tell us back in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy, blessed, happy is the man or woman who has humbled himself or herself and got down off of the throne of their life. We get down off of the throne of our lives and we say, Lord, this throne is not my throne. This throne is yours. You are king of my life. You are Lord of my life. I'm going to worship you in humility. And these are the ones, Jesus says, they're the ones that are truly part of the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit who in humility have gotten off the throne and said, I'm not the boss, Lord. You are the boss. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to present my body to you. Do whatever you please. And this is what we must decide. A one-time decision followed by day-to-day -day moments of worship. Are you going to worship the Lord today? And this is, and Paul says, this is what's acceptable to the Lord. To worship Him daily, to make that one-time decision backed up by daily worship. I love what John Scott says, I'll give you the quote, he says this, This worship is not only to be offered in the temple, the courts, or in the church building. This doesn't just happen when you come here or in a Bible study. This doesn't just happen in these places, but rather in home life and in the marketplace. It is a presentation of our bodies to God in our home, in the marketplace, wherever the Lord takes us. Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to obey you wherever my feet take you, no matter what the circumstance looks like. And this is how do we respond to a God that showed us unconditional love and mercy and the only reasonable response. This is what Paul says. The only reasonable response is true worship. It's daily worship, rejecting our pride and saying, Lord, I'm going to serve you. Do with me as you please. And yeah, there's times I mess up. And that's, guys, this is, this is the amazing thing where you learn in Romans 9 through 11. There's times we're faithless. There's times we mess up. There's times where I get into the mud as the prodigal son did. But what did the prodigal son do when he got into the mud? He says, what am I doing here? What, what am I doing in the mud? I don't belong with the pigs in the mud. I belong in the house of my father. I'm going to repent. I'm going to go back. Because if my father loves me, he has a place for me. We talked about on Wednesday night, God has a place for us. And so we go back to the Father, Lord, forgive me for my sins. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just. He will do what is right. And what will he do? What is the right thing he will do? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from how much? All. Not just one third, not just two thirds, not just some of it. All unrighteousness. God will cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess and that's why we need to keep short accounts with the Lord. Keep short this relationship. I have to have short accounts vertically. Lord, forgive me. This is why I love David. David saying in Psalm 139, search me, Lord. Know my heart, know my anxiety, see if there's any grievous way in me, and then lead me in the way everlasting. Help me to repent, and then lead me in the way everlasting. And then we live this out. And as we live out a daily, moment by moment, restored relationship with God, what does it look like as we adventure through the world? What does it look like in the valley and in the trials of life? Because I'm going to tell you, man, as you start to live this out, the enemy's going to come against and attack. And what does that attack look like? Paul tells us exactly what is going to happen as we begin to live this out. Verse 2, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Even though we are a new creation, even though we have the spirit, even though we're part of the kingdom of God, a different kingdom, God's brought us out and brought us in, the enemy's going to be attacked. Do not be surprised when the enemy attacks you as a child of the most high God. And one of the main attacks that come upon believers is there is a pressure from the kingdom of this world. And what does Paul say? There is a pressure from the kingdom of this world to what? The word he uses is conform. There is pressure to conform. And the idea of being conformed, you guys understand this idea of being conformed? This is saying that there is a mold. The world has a mold and it says you need to be part of this mold and you're going to fit in that mold and we're going to shape you into that mold and you are going to be, and we're all going to be little identical molds of each other. We're going to go out and be identical. It's to be shaped into a mold by external pressure. The world knows very clearly. They see a believer and they say, there's something different about that person. 
How in the world does that person have hope in a time like this? Impossible. The times are challenging. The times are crazy. How in the world do you have hope in a time like this? And there's only one answer. It's because of Jesus. Because Jesus has changed me. Because Jesus is my Savior. He's king and he's sitting on the throne. I'm not worried about what the circumstance looks like. Jesus is king. He's Lord of my life. And the king of this world, they see that and they're just like, it blows them off. They're like, what in the world is happening? And so what do they do? How does the kingdom of this world respond to believers? They say, wait a minute, believer. You're getting out of line now. You need to come on back here and be part of this mold that we've got going on. Why do you think they attack the church so much and try to get the church to do everything the world is doing? They want this pressure to conform to the mold that they have, this mold where you just follow your heart and it's going to be great or redouble your efforts, it's going to be fine. The mold that they have is not based on any truth or reality. It's based on something that they're feeling at the moment. It's why it changes all the time. And yet we have to acknowledge the pressure that the world and the enemy puts on a believer is immense. You've been under that pressure. When we had COVID and we had gentlemen and ladies in our church that says, I'm not going to take that the vaccine. I, I feel the Lord telling me not to do it. The pressure that they were under, immense. Blew my mind just meeting with people and praying with people. Whether you take that vaccine or not, I'm just saying the pressure of the world was immense. And that's just one example. There's so much pressure on our young people to go do crazy things. The pressure, we have to acknowledge that the pressure that the world places upon us is immense pressure. It's crazy. But God, again, he tells us, you don't have to conform. You don't have to give in to the pressure. You don't have to believe as the world believes. You don't have to think how the world thinks. And you definitely do not have to act as the world acts. God is saying very simply, I want something different. I want something better in the life of a believer. Because your relationship with the Lord is restored, because you are justified, because God is sanctifying you, filling you with his spirit. And one day he's going to glorify you. He's already there in that moment. He says, you don't have to conform to a mold. I want to transform you from the inside out to be more like Christ. That he's done internal surgery. He's given us new life. That's seen externally. It's that word of transform. I have a picture there for you. The word there is metamorphosis. That there is a radical inner transformation that occurs. It's a caterpillar, the most ugliest bug in the history of bugs. I've seen some ugly caterpillars. I think Kelsey's planted us the butter tree up here. And so you'll have these caterpillars that go on that tree. Ugly bugs. And then there's an internal change that happens in the life of the caterpillar. And that cocoon is formed around that caterpillar. And out of that cocoon comes a beautiful butterfly. A beautiful butterfly should have <laughs> But this is what it is. There's a change that occurs from within. It's not an external pressure that changes us. There's a change from within. The Holy Spirit working in us, changing us from the inside out, transforming us from the inside out as this butterfly, as the butterfly is transformed. We're transformed, and how does this take place? Paul tells us how this takes place very clearly. He says, by the renewal of your mind. The transformation is happening by the renewal of your mind. That God, he says, when there's a heart transformation, there's another transformation that needs to happen in you, and it's your mind needs to be renewed. Why? Why does my mind need to be renewed? Renewed. What influences and impacts the mold of this world's thinking? What are the influences that are going on in the kingdom of this world today? You look at some of these things that are going on in our in our, our colleges, where these teachers are teaching these kids, and they're saying that they don't even realize that they're saying it. Even Christians are saying it from the river to the sea. What does that mean? They don't even know what it means. What are you doing? There's there's pressure. There's a, there's some people's minds have just been so seared that they teach things, and there's this pressure that goes on kids in colleges. And it's not just in that one area, it's all kinds of areas. Talk to these college kids. This pressure is immense. The teachers are teaching these things, and, and what else impacts the thinking of this world? Inner 
entertainers. And I'm not sure how smart entertainers are. Some of these things that come out of their mouths just blow my mind, and yet that's the heroes of kids. How many times, I mean, I, I, I watch, I go walking early in the morning, and, and there's cars that drive past, there's this music just blaring. At six in the morning, I'm like, man, that's crazy. And I listen to some of these thick lyrics that are in these songs that they're just blasting, and they're singing these lyrics, and I'm, your mouth needs to be washed out with soap. And I'm like, what is going on? And yet, they don't even blush. They don't even bat an eye. Some of these movies that come out are just, so careful because it's impacting our mind. The world is impacted. This is how the world controls it. The media, the entertainers, even peers. And what do you see so many people doing to that? You know, you go out on a date and there's a couple that's sitting there. What are both of them doing? 80% of the time. Between Lorena and I. 
Why is there a robust discussion? It's because Eli wants his way. Pride. I don't operate in humility at times. I want my way. Because my way is the right way. And I need to walk in humility. I need to choose to let out the very word of God to my life and for my spouse. I say, Lord, what, what you've done for me, I'm going to extend to my wife freely. Lord, do a work in my life. And when I do that, when I live out God's word, I prove that God's way is acceptable, perfect, and right. It's proved, because I begin to live it out. I say, why would I live any other way? Why would I live any other way? This is the way to go. And so, uh, in, the, in the video we watched, uh, the, the gentleman said, uh, marriage is two imperfect people. Two imperfect people, two flawed individuals who come together Christian marriage, and in a Christian marriage, they're able to extend God's love to each other. And as they extend God's love to each other, as they extend God's love to their spouse through the strength of the Spirit, the world takes notice because that's a miracle. The world takes notice at Christian marriage. Pastor Rick would often remind us from the pulpit, he would say, every marriage is what? Every marriage that makes it is a miracle because God did something in that marriage. And it was two flawed people who humbled themselves and got off the throne and said, Lord, whatever you have for me, I'm going to be obedient, and that's what you have for me. That's what your word says. I'm going to live it out. I'm going to live it out in reality. And so marriage is this beautiful picture to the world of God's great love for us. And so marriage, the, 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 people, the, the world has to conclude this is a miracle. This is a miracle, and so God's word is true. As we live it out, we prove God's word. We prove that God's way is perfect. It's the best way to adventure through this life that we have. And who do I prove it to first? I prove it to my kids. Because my little kids, they watch. They watch Eli and Lorena. Do they see us make mistakes? Absolutely. You got he was here, Lorena was here. Do they see us make mistakes? Absolutely they did. And yet my hope is that they saw us being able to reconcile and repent before the Lord of each other. Because this is, these are the things that are important. I want to give my kids a good example. I want to prove to them that God's way is the only way. It's the right way. I'll give you another example. There was that movie. It was years ago. I don't totally remember. It was called The Way of the Spear. Maybe you saw that movie where these, these families went down to South America. They said, we want to reach some unreached tribes out in the jungle. And they go out there and they begin to witness to these tribesmen and women. And what do those tribesmen and women do? They kill the husbands. They kill them. Dead. And the wives will pack up their bags and kill their husbands. Let's get out of here. And yet, they said, wait a minute. What does the word of the Lord say? What is God calling us to do? And they went back to the word of the Lord. And they, in God's word, they said, we're to love our enemies. Pray for those who have mistreated us. And they began to pray for these tribesmen, and they, they went back and they began to show these tribesmen the love of God. And these tribesmen were blown away. They said, what is going on? Who are you? Why are you doing this? Why aren't you trying to get revenge for what we did to your husbands? And those tribes get radically saved because these women proved God's will, that it was good and perfect and right. And these, all these guys get saved. And you might say, man, Eli, those two examples are well and good. But what if, oh, I hate what if statements. What if I walk in obedience and I never see any results? What if? I got to remind you this morning, church, the results are not up to you. You cannot change anyone else. And where's that the most easiest to see? I cannot change my life. I cannot, she cannot change me. There must be a work of the Spirit. All that I can do is say, you know what, Lord, I repent, and I'm going to walk in obedience. You are Lord of my life. And that becomes the amazing thing, because then God begins to work. Where first? Here first. And then here. And he begins to do amazing things, exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask for him. I cannot change, you cannot change anyone else. 
And there are times where you walk in obedience. You're going to walk in obedience through this life and you will not see the result that you are looking for. And you're going to get discouraged. There's a temptation in that to get discouraged. And you're going to say, I don't see a result. I've been living it for years and I don't see any result. The results are up to the Lord. And he tells us this very clearly in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 36 through 38. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They didn't see the result that they were looking for. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. They didn't see the results they were looking for. But the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. The Lord says they walked in obedience. They had faith. They never saw the result they were looking for, and the world wasn't worthy of it. Because the results are up to the Lord. The results are not up to me. The results are up to the Lord. And here is the amazing thing. God will always do the right thing in the right way and at the right time. His timing is not my timing. My timing is Burger King timing. My way, right away. God's timing is not Burger King timing. God's timing is eternity timing. He's looking at eternity. He's not looking at this my way, right away nonsense. He says, I have something better in store. I'm looking at eternity. I am going to do what is right at the right time in the right way. And you might not live to see it. But are you going to have faith and trust me? That it's for your good and my glory. Man, and I'm going to bring you safely home. And so here's the challenge for us this morning. Our relationship with the Lord is the most important thing. These first two verses set up the rest of the book of Romans. Because Paul says, out of, my, out of your relationship with the Lord, every other relationship is going to follow. Your relationship with the church, we're going to talk about it next week. Your relationship to an unbelieving world, we're going to talk about it in two weeks. Your relationship to the government, we're going to talk about it in three weeks. Every other relationship flows out of a relationship between you and the Holy God. Is your relationship with the Lord restored? Have you responded as Abraham did? Have you responded to God in faith? Are you keeping, if you've responded to God in faith, are you keeping short accounts with the Lord? Or are there times, is there discouragement and bitterness that's crept into your heart? And you've begun to blame the Lord. Repent. We need to keep short accounts with the Lord. Are you being transformed? Has this butterfly? Or is that pressure? Are you giving into the pressure of the world? You do not have to give into the pressure of the world. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You do not have to give into the pressure. You're filled with this very spirit of God. Are you being transformed? Are you living it out? Are you living it out? Are you proving that the only way to adventure through this life is God's way? That God's way is right and good and perfect. And when this happens in the life of a believer, what's the result? The result is that what God has done for us overflows out of us. What God has done for us overflows out of us, and that becomes a miracle. And John Stott will give you this last quote, because we're going to walk as Christ walked. And this is what John Stott says. He says, when this happens, then our feet will walk in his paths. Our lips will speak the truth and spread the gospel. Our tongues will bring healing our hands will lift up those who have fallen and perform many mundane tasks as well, like cooking and cleaning, typing and mending. Our arms will embrace the lonely and the unloved. Our ears will listen to the cries of the distressed, and our eyes will look humbly and patiently towards God. I look at that. Really all that John Stott is giving us is an example of Jesus Christ. And I got through the first three and and it's just like, Lord, I can't do this. Our feet are going to walk in these paths. Prone to wander, Lord. How many times have you felt that pressure to wander from the path of the Lord? Our lips are going to speak the truth. Oh my goodness. How big was the fish? Yeah, it was that big. I'm going to spread the gospel. And I just stopped it. Our tongues were going to heal it. How many times have, has my tongue brought destruction? I'm a believer. How many times has the enemy used my mouth to say anything? Have you ever done that? The words are coming out. <laughs> Get it back in my mouth. 
What am I saying? I want my mouth to bring healing. And I looked at these things. I said, Lord, I can't do these things. And if you're like me and you look at this and you say, Lord, I can't do this, you're in good company. Because none of us can. And this is my cry this morning. Lord, help me. Help me. Lord, I want this to be true in my life. I want you to overflow out of me because of what you've done for me. I want you to overflow out of me and that the world can be impacted. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Give me the ability and the strength and the power to live a life set apart for you. Help me to worship you daily. That you are Lord of my life. Is God Lord of your life? Is there Lordship in your life? Help me to walk, Lord, in the good works that you prepared before, for me before time began. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. You are God's workmanship. I hate the word workmanship. I love the word masterpiece. You're God's masterpiece. Oima. I look at myself and I say, there's no way this is a masterpiece. This is just totally flawed, totally terrible. There's nothing good in me, Lord. Oh my gosh. Why does the Lord say I'm his masterpiece? Because he sees the end result. I'm not there yet. You're not there yet. And this is the amazing thing. Almighty man of valor is what he called Gideon. Gideon, there was nothing mighty about him in that moment. But God saw the end result. He was already there. Almighty man of valor or mighty woman of valor. God has already seen the end. You're his masterpiece is what he says. And he says, because you're my masterpiece, because I've already seen the end, I've created good things, good works, good things for you to do. As you walk in adventure through life, walk in it. Be filled with the Spirit. And as I'm filled with the Spirit, out of the overflow of the Spirit, my tongue is going to say things that are going to bring healing. Instead of saying things that destroy me. As I walk through life, I'm going to be helping others rather than putting others down and using them. As I walk through life, I'm going to walk as Christ. This is 1 John chapter 2. It says, as you abide in Christ, so walk in Him. I'm going to walk in Christ. So the challenge for you, worship God today. And so Father God, Lord, we, we love you. Lord, there's so many times we fail. So many times we miss the mark. There's so many times, Lord, where I'm like the prodigal son and just I get in the mud. Lord, help me to keep short accounts with you. Lord, help that to be a daily moment. I know there's a one-time decision, Lord. I thank you for that justification. I thank you for the cross. And Lord, help me to make that daily decision to worship you today because you are King of kings. You are Lord of lords. You are Lord of my life. Lord, help me to live that out, Lord. Help me to walk as you walk. Lord, I pray for my mouth. Lord, that you would use my words, my words would be used by you to bring healing and not harm. And Lord, whatever's up there on that board for whatever, whatever is going on here with your people, God, would you bring something to their mind that you're working on, Lord, because I'm, I, I'm a work in progress. I'm not finished yet. None of us here are finished yet. And so, Lord, would you continue that good work that you began in us? Would you complete that good work at the day of Jesus Christ when we see you face to face? And Lord, I pray that on that day we would hear those words well done.